Well, we've got a lot more going on besides Ironworks here on Friday mornings and Wednesday nights, and we're really trying to urge you to think about and, and move toward getting into a small group. You go on the website, look for small groups, and you'll see a, a selection of groups that are there that we're getting started. And, uh, and you may already be in a small group, and if you are, we'd like, to kn we'd like to know about that, not to police that at all, but just to affirm you and also just to know what's happening because we know there's a lot of maverick stuff going on there out there, unsupervised Bible study. <laughs> and, but we'd love to know about that. And uh, it's a joy when I discover guys that say, yeah, I've been in a small group for the last five years and here's the three guys I'm with. And that's an encouragement to all of us. So uh, let us know. But uh, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer this morning, shall we? Father, we thank you for this day that you have made, that uh, you have a purpose for, and um, we are tools in your hands. We want to be sharpened, equipped. We want to be put to use. We would love by the end of the day to put our head on the pillow and say, Lord, I have walked with you in a fresh and new and powerful way. And so we pray that this can add to that, that this can start our day with fortitude. Thank you for your presence. We ask your guidance. Bless our speaker this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, this is our very first day <clears throat> of Ironworks, the VeggieTales version. Because this is Adam Broccoli. These guys don't even get that. <laughs> He's bigger than I am. I'm going to leave. <laughs> but uh, I've asked Adam to come and be a part of our faculty through this time, so uh, he's a good brother. Many of you know, most of you know Adam. Everywhere I look, and at, wherever, everywhere Adam goes, there's a group of men around him. He's a, he's a magnet for guys. So, Adam, thank you, brother. Bless you as you share with us this morning. Um, <laughs> we ever stop growing up until the Lord takes us home, right? Um. So thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, waking up this morning and um, spending time with guys, right? It's important. We need other people in our life. We need the iron sharpening iron, right? I need it. And, uh, you know, we've been going through this series now for three weeks called Fortitude. We are marching through the book of Joshua, and we're talking about fortitude. Now, as a younger man in the room... Oh, sorry. So I got one laugh over here. So um, I look at the times that we're in, and I agree with all our pastors and our leaders that we as men need to stand up and be strong for Jesus. We must have fortitude in this time. Um, in my 40 years of, I hit 40 this year, so that's kind of like a, a big deal for me, but uh, in my 40 years, I've seen the darkness of culture and our our culture get more and more engaged in sin and um we need to stand strong we need to have fortitude um to get through we need to have fortitude for our families so that we can lead our families into jesus right and it doesn't stop until christ takes us home right we can't just like retire at some point spiritually and be like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna stop having fortitude. I'm I've I've done my part. No, we we need to stay in the game. So we need to exhibit courage in the name of Jesus, for the fame of Jesus, for the glory of Jesus, and for the transformation of others in Jesus. These times are getting harder and harder. And one thing that always encourages me as these times are getting harder is the reality that as things get dark around us, the light of the glory of Jesus Christ shines brighter in the darkness, right? You don't go out and you don't watch fireworks during the day. Why is that? You can't see them, right? And I was reminded of that as things get dark around us and it gets difficult, the light of the glory of the gospel shines through and it becomes more radiant. 
So don't don't be discouraged. Don't turn back in fear. John 1, 5 says, The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. All right, let's be reminded of what fortitude means. We've talked about it. I I guess I don't really need to remind us, because we've talked about it like five times already in the announcements and everything. But um, it's courage in pain and adversity. Biblically speaking, fortitude is the strength of character that enables a person to endure pain and adversity with courage. And one of the best ways to be reminded of fortitude in people are the people um, that, that are in the Bible. People are a good primer. Their stories are a good primer to remind us what they are. Through many of these stories, we, it's almost as if we hear God saying, be strong and courageous, right? Don't fear. You can hear that echo. How about Abraham? Abraham, by faith, had fortitude. He was used to be a blessing to many generations. Now, did he get it right all the time? Remember when he said his wife was his sister? Yikes. Sarah was taken off by King Abimelech. Not one of your top ten moments, say Abraham, right? But he still had fortitude throughout his life. Uh, pause and think for a moment about the story of taking Isaac up on that mountain. Do you think that was difficult as a dad? You bet. Be strong and courageous. You can hear the echo there. Daniel in the lion's den. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Be strong and courageous. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And with names like this, we are reminded of the story without having to tell it, right? But in the whispers of the fire, you hear, be strong and courageous. How about Paul? Paul says this in Ephesians, or sorry, Philippians, where we're preaching through. While in prison, he says this. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear right? Be strong and courageous. How about the martyr Stephen? As he was being stoned for proclaiming Jesus, he says this in regards to the people that are stoning him to to the Lord. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. He's saying this to God in regards of these various people that are throwing these rocks, right? Remember, Saul was most likely there. And I can't help but think that maybe that was directed to God with Saul in mind. Can you hear it again as the rocks are flying? What do we hear? Be strong and courageous. Now the single greatest example of fortitude is this. And being found in the form of human Being found in human form, he, Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So at that name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All right, so let's let's recap quickly. Chapter 1, Moses died, and the leadership is being transferred to Joshua. And we read in chapter 1 that the torch is being passed from this very old gentleman, Moses, to a very young Joshua. No, nope. how old was Joshua, roughly? 
75, 80 years old when that was being, that torch was being passed. And that's important for us to know the context of that. It means Joshua has 40 years of manna in the wilderness, of eating the same stuff, providing, being provided by God daily. Um, knowing of the temple and the ark, or the ark of the covenant, experiencing the fire of God in the sky and the cloud that would descend. He experienced it. Now, I'm not great with numbers, okay? I'm not like a huge number guy. You probably gathered that. But um, if the torch was being, ch- you know, taught, you know, exchanged from Moses to Joshua when he was in his 80s, um, I'm thinking that Pastor Roger has somewhere around 15 more years in men's ministry. <laughs> oh man, sorry, I had to put that in there. We can debate biblical ideas about retirement another time, Lord willing. But um, um, but the drumbeat is is still here, is being strong and courageous. Chapter two, I love how Roger kind of unpacked. Re- Chapter 2, I wound wound up sweating a little bit after he was up there preaching about chapter 2 because um, it was a little bit of a a theological wrestling match in my head going on. We have this infinitely holy, sovereign, transcendent, and just God, and you're looking at the candidates that he's using. (laughs) Wow. Wow. We really, uh, God has a lot to work with, right? Um, I love love how Roger said, God uses the most unlikely candidates, but he uses them to glorify himself. And then chapter two comes to an end, the spies come back from Jericho, and now it's time to step forward in faith. Joshua chapter three. When Joshua rose early, then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out for, from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan. He and all the people of Israel lodged there before passing over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet... There shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way that you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass before the people. So they took up the Ark of the covenant and went before the people. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel. And they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. There's a major shift going on in this chapter. Joshua is starting to prepare his people for the battle. Right, he's preparing his people for the battle, but the battle is a little bit different. You could say at the same time he's preparing his people to walk into the promised land. Point one: God goes before His people and He leads us into it, into the battle, into the promised land. I was reminded by reading this that God goes before us. He is not a God that leads us from behind. Or leads us accidentally. The Ark of the Covenant is what? It's a visual representation of God's presence on earth. And eventually the Ark of the Covenant foreshadows who? Jesus, right? That Jesus is going to come down and dwell amongst us. Jesus is going to dwell and make a way for man to be freed from his sin. Now, if we have any measure of fortitude in our lives, it's going to be because we realize that God is the source of our strength. God gives us courage. God gives us 
life, and hope, and peace. This stands in contrast to everything that we hear these days. Let's not fall into the trap that the world preaches, that true courage can be found in yourself. I hear that all the time. Corporate, I work at a company. We all work, we all work somewhere, right? But how many of us work at companies that have this like, dig deep, find the courage within you. Ugh. I'm vomiting inside. This is gross. Be on guard. One of my favorite musicians is a gospel rapper. His name's Shailene. He said this. Every once in a while you hear one of these sentences that hits you. He said this. It's called selfism. It's the fastest growing religion. They just dress it up and call it Christian. We are in a battle that they're trying, the world's trying to push, push this idea of selfism. Do you hear it? It's all about you. It's all about you. And it stands in direct comp- opposition to what we see here, right? Does this book say it's all about us? What does this book say? I don't see in this book anywhere that it says it's all about us. Keep looking. If you find it, let me know, right? New Age and selfism teaching is, a blend, is blending itself into the church and it's diluting the message of the gospel. Syn- Anybody know what syncretism means? It's defined as the combination of two different forms of belief or practice. Webster says this, the word syncretism does not appear in the Bible, but the subject of syncretism is certainly addressed and condemned in the scriptures. From a biblical perspective, syncretism is the blending together of Yahweh worship, worship of God, with pagan worship. The religion of selfism is what we fight against. And we fight against it because at the, at the throne of selfism is the, the devil himself. And the drumbeat of selfism is love yourself, do whatever's best for you. Let your feelings lead you. And all these phrases produce a cacophony, one of Roger's favorite words, right? (laughs) Of marketing slogans that we get from the popular hip bandwagon companies. Don't drink their Kool-Aid or their coffee. Selfism has produced a generation of me monsters, right? Some people would say they're me millennials, right? And here's the deal. The fruit that, that they're producing, it's not good fruit. And it's sad, and we need to help them see that it's not about them. It's about God. It's about trusting in Jesus Christ. And so I was reminded about that as I read this, is God goes before us. It's about him. It is his battle. We need to anchor ourselves to him because we're not going to find good stuff in and of ourselves, even if we dig deep. We're just going to keep finding more messes. Today we have some of the highest rates of anxiety, and they're growing. Could this be because we buy the lie that we can do it all on our own? Yet deep inside we're aware that we can't do it. Fortitude is not rooted in the self, it's rooted in God. And we fail if we are rooted in ourselves. The ark went before the people of God because God is their hope and source of strength. Not their strongest soldiers. Point two, Joshua is obedient. What does Joshua do? Joshua goes and he prepares the people for this, right? Now, sometimes, you know, I was looking at this point, it's a little bit of a smaller point, but 
you know, people are, are not always easy to lead. Um, I, I have a hard time leading my kids to the car for church on Sunday um, and making sure that they have, you know, the right shoes on or even socks on sometimes. Um, so this is no, you, in, in leading people, it requires fortitude. But what does Josh, Josh, Joshua do? People, the ark will go before you. You're going to come second. We've heard that before. He has the people form up behind the ark around 2,000 cubits, which is what? Somewhere between half mile to three quarter of a mile. There's a good reason why. So that God may show them the way that they're going to go, but also God is powerful. And God can't handle sin in his holy presence, right? Don't get too close to that ark. People have been vaporized before, right? Didn't they have to tie like ropes on... I don't want to be the guy on the end of the rope being pulled out. I don't know if I want to be the guy pulling the rope to get the guy out, right? But the power lies in God. Verse, verse 5 there, God calls, Joshua calls the people to consecrate themselves. What does this mean? This means to make a conscious and willing decision to dedicate your soul, mind, and heart and body to the Lord. It's a verb, do action, right? Sanctify, prepare yourself spiritually unto the Lord. He's going to do wonderful things. Don't be like the people back in chapter 2. A little bit drastic contrast right there, right? Go sanctify yourself, prepare yourself, consecrate yourself. Joshua prepares them to the new the next right thing. As I thought about it longer, I was like, how many people are we talking about? How many people is he preparing for this task? And I was reminded about a time where I was in charge of 200 cars, 100 owned vehicles, roughly 100 to 125 rental vehicles, and 325 college students driving those vehicles. College students aren't very much different than high school students. I'll just <laughs> newsflash, right? And, and I could tell you stories of, you know, getting a call at two in the morning from um, Wyoming and hearing a cow bellow in the background. And I'm like, what's going on here? Well, I hit the cow and it's stuck to the top of the Mazda rental car. What? Uh, and the sheriff is out here, boom, shoots the cow on the top of the rental car. Well, we're going to have, we're going to, I think we just bought a rental car. <laughs> you know, people are not easy to lead. And, you know, so I'm, I'm looking into how many people are, are, is Joshua preparing here? And it's anywhere from between 600,000. I looked around in a lot of places. Some places say it's upwards of 3 million. It's like getting the population of South Dakota, maybe and Nebraska. There's not a t terrible amount of people there, but getting them to move all together. I mean, I was trying to work with 300 college students, and that was just like mind-blowing. Can you imagine working with that many people to prepare them for this journey across the Jordan. It's a serious deal going on here. Point three, who will begin to exalt, exalt Joshua? God will exalt Joshua in the sight of all Israel. Why? That they, Israel, may know that he, just as he was with Moses, he is with them, right? What does it say? Just as I was with Moses, I am with you. It does not say Joshua is going to exalt himself. He has so much confidence and, 
You know, no, it doesn't say that. And thank God it doesn't say that. We wouldn't, we wouldn't want to read it. God's going to exalt him. He's raising up this man after Moses so that God's chosen people would not forget who's in charge. Just like with Moses, God still is with him. Just like God is still with them and for him, he has not forsaken him. He is here for his people. He is not going away from them. Very similarly to Moses, we find, find another body of water that's being parted for people to walk across on dry land. It's amazing. I, I can't help but try to put myself there and hearing somebody say, Hey, Asa, remember when Dad was telling us about how, we walk, how he and Mom walked across the sea on dry ground and they were, they were spared from Pharaoh's army? This is kind of what's going on here. Another reminder that God's with them. Why is this important? It's important to be reminded that God is with them because we need reminding daily, right? I heard, I heard it said once that every seven days people lose vision. People lose their direction. I would say, maybe because I have a little ADD at times, I'm distracted, I probably lose my, my direction five to ten times a day, you know? But um, I have this hymn that plays in my head constantly. And it, it's always playing in my head, and I start humming it at work. <laughs> and my coworkers are like, oh, he's singing again. What's he singing? You know, this guy's a little weird. And so, one of my coworkers, oh, Broccoli, what are you singing now? I work at a body shop, and this is not the most holy set-apart place on the map, right? If you've worked in the shop, you know that, right? And part of the hymn, that, the part of him that keeps being repeated in my head is this truth. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Why is God raising up Joshua in the sight of Israel? Are they prone to wander? Do they need to be reminded that God is with them? Do we need to be reminded daily that God is with us? You bet. You bet. We need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Brothers, we need to we need to be reminded. One of the best reminders is that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in these days, the only way that we can endure fortitude is to look to Jesus and put our hope in Jesus for every moment of the day, right? Because if we don't, we're going to be bankrupt in ourselves. You can dig deep and try to find something good in there, but Jesus needs to clean it out. That's the message that we need to help other men. Jesus is your hope. You need to have hope in Jesus, not in yourself. All right, well, um, I, got, I got a few discussion questions there somewhere. I don't know if it's on the back side of the page, but... Um, where do you need to have fortitude? Work through those questions with your group and uh, you know, just talk through some of those things. Let me pray, pray for us before we, we, we dive into our groups. Lord, thank you for reminding us that you, it's all about you. It's not about us. When we put ourselves before you, we experience ruin. God, I pray for the men in our church that you would help to strengthen their marriages, help them to put you first in their marriage. 
in their relationships with their kids, family members, in their work with their, with their coworkers. Lord, we want this gospel message to go out. We want to see a gospel transformation in the lives of our, our family, our children, our churches. And we acknowledge that that starts here with us. Continue to transform our lives. Help people see that it's not about any one of us, but it's all about you. We pray and ask that you would help, help, help us be reminded of that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.